It's just an honor to have uh, Dr. Joseph Gahn Gerlbach, um, an associate professor um, in the clinical area um, who studies American culture, more specifically Native American studies. He's from University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He has published uh, more than 50 articles and chapters exploring the cultural psychology of self, identity, personhood, and social relations in indigenous community settings vis-a-vis -vis the mental health professions, with particular emphasis and attention to the therapeutic interventions, such as uh, psychotherapy and traditional healing. He's a recipient of several fellowships and three career awards. He was named a fellow of the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation in 2014. During the 2014-15 academic year, he is occupying the chair, the endowed chair uh, of the Katz family in Native American Studies at Montana State University in Bozeman. And I am really happy that you are here today. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Dr. Vaughn. Set this down so it won't block the view of those in the front. And, uh, thanks, Gina. It's a pleasure to come visit you all. We've been visiting all day on and off with little groups of students and so on. Um, but one of the things I'm most excited about is the opportunity to present to you uh, in this building and in the context of Native Studies as well as Clinical Psychology is that uh, my career has been shaped in influential ways by being appointed both in the Department of Psychology and in the Native American Studies program at the University of Michigan. That's an unusual appointment. Most uh, psychologists, or even Indian psychologists, are not in Native Studies. And so uh, it's been very fruitful for me to have an intersection. And part of what I hope to do is today is to say some things that I, uh, should ideally stimulate your thinking, but then to provoke some conversation in which those of you who are more familiar or embedded within Native Studies may have some things to say to those who are more embedded in either clinical psychology or the mental health and counseling professions in general. I should also uh, say up front that um, I feel like my role as a scholar is to take received conventional ideas, understanding, engagement, and so on, and turn them on its head and to shake it upside down and to try and look and see how well things hold together in the end. So most of what I have to say in any uh, presentation like this is stuff that uh, has to challenge uh, often frequently circulated assumptions. So um, I do so sometimes in a deliberately provocative manner to keep you engaged and on your feet and listening um, and to think about things in the way that I do. It doesn't mean that you'll agree with me and I don't uh, expect in all instances that people I talk to um, come to be persuaded by what I have to say. But I do hope that it's stimulating for purposes of conversation and discussion. Um, let's start just by anchoring who I am a little more. Um, uh, as Nikita said in introducing me, I am uh, a, a member of the Wilbon tribe of Montana. We are on the Coast Island Reservation. I was born in Helena and grew up in a lot of cities in Montana, graduating from Black High School in Kalispell some years ago. And I spent time uh, at three different colleges over five years including a student in the Army before I decided I wanted to be a psychologist and pursuing my doctorate. Um, I am clinically trained as a psychologist, which is, of course, most people's impression when they hear you're a psychologist. They come in, as soon as have a therapy, you've got someone on the couch, they're telling you your problems, all sorts of things. Um, but I don't practice psychology, actually. I make my living as a research psychologist, and I teach, and I write, and I think, and I conduct uh, studies of various kinds. But those studies are community engaged. Uh, they're on Native American issues in partnership usually with Native American communities, some constituencies or others within those communities. And because they're concerned with mental health issues with those communities, they almost always have a cultural component that's really important for the work that they do. So I'd like to say that I'm clinically trained, community engaged, and culturally attuned in the work that I do. I think that will come through in the things I have to say today. Broadly construed, my research interests are the intersection of culture and mental health. Um, that's a big set of topics that uh, in healthcare in general uh, is typically attended to today. Um, but obviously my interest, specific interests are in Native American communities and therefore in the kind of indigenous psychologies or indigenous aspects of psychological experience that play a role in what uh, many uh, 
health professionals are up to. And a specific focus as Buddha said is on cross-cultural therapies. And I use the term therapies sort of broadly and in the plural form because I don't just mean psychotherapy of the kind you find in uh, much of Western healthcare, but I also mean traditional healing practices, which are therapies in that way as well, and certainly have psychological components too. This picture is a picture I took at a uh, healing lodge where I did a study some years back. I'm going to summarize a little bit of the findings from the healing lodge in the middle of this talk. And, um, it was a substance use treatment program in which there was a room for uh, indigenous clients to go and smudge and pray uh, when they felt the I really have a critical question I want us to think about together today, and it's this. Is therapy culture properly suited to redressing the contemporary ills of indigenous communities? And this question obviously has a lot of pieces to it. I've called something therapy culture in quotations. I'll develop that uh, with some help from uh, sociologists and cultural theorists who've thought about this. And of course, I'm thinking about the ills, the problems, the difficulties, or dilemmas, or challenges of indigenous communities. So it's embedded in community, and, and it's about the role of therapy uh, to uh, assist with those. Because of course, as you can imagine, uh, therapists in Indian country certainly see themselves as there to assist with the ills of Indian country. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, I want to uh, raise a question that it seems like it would be a subtle question, we'll all, of course, answer yes. But I think there might be reasons for us to reconsider this question and to consider other uh, answers as well. And I specifically want to develop this question with reference to four different domains of inquiry. So, let's start with one. That comes more from what I have experienced and encountered in Native American studies rather than uh, clinical psychology or the social sciences. Um, who here has read Michel Foucault at some point in your education? So a few people, not a lot, okay. Um, Michel Foucault is a historian and sociologist, French, um, and has really did a lot for advancing critical theory in how we think about society and human interaction and so on. And um, I'm bringing him up today because he was really influential in putting forth an analysis of how societal arrangements um, harness and deploy power for purposes of constructing lived experience that people, human beings, have to fall into as a result of the way things are organized or arranged. Um, the key concepts he talked about were power, discourse, which are kind of set ways of thinking, talking, and acting around uh, stable ideas. A uh, discourse uh, could be um, like, uh, well, I'll give an example here in a moment. As, and, and personhood is the other third concept. Or the way in which human beings and human lives get uh, channeled into these uh, uh, expressions of power that carve out certain roles and relationships for people long before people even have um, the ability to make choices about. So Foucault's interest was really in what we might call subjectivity, or lived experience that human beings have, and the way powerful social structures come to channel, or corral, or stamp out, carve out, cookie cutter, um, the modes of life of people. Now, I first read Foucault uh, in his uh, famous book called Discipline and Punish. And Discipline and Punish is about the history of kind of legal, uh, efforts uh, to con contain criminality and so on. And um, Foucault's thesis in Discipline and Punishment was that there's been a long uh, march through history between very overt, explicit public attempts to punish people for bad behavior, criminal behavior, to a shift toward more internal self-disciplinary control. The example he gives, he starts off with an, uh, a, a person who tried to kill a king in one of the European countries. And of course, if you try to kill the king, the king is by divine right appointed. It's God's will that the king should rule. And so if you raise your hand against the king, you're really raising your hand against God. It requires a massive retaliation. So the first few pages of Discipline and Punish are all the horrible things that happened to this guy who tried to kill the king. You know, from breaking him on the wheel to hanging him in a way that doesn't quite kill him but just suffocates him to finally drawing and quartering him and dragging his body through the streets and hanging down a post outside the city, right? So there's a sense in which punishment at that point in uh, European history was all about the public spectacle of making sure it's about the body and about what you do to human bodies when they've done things that are against king and country. 
Um, but he then traces out how in a more modern society, we've come from that. We don't do public punishment. You, you can't really go see a hanging or a public execution. It's all done the way that's much more sanitized now. And in fact, the way uh, the state organizes disciplinary stuff um, is much more internal in the way that I talk about. And Foucault's best example of this was to look at a, a, a blueprint for a prison that was never built. It was designed by Jeremy Bentham. And the prison itself was called a panopticon. Have you heard of this term panopticon? So um, you can see that you have the prison here. And the idea of the panopticon is that the prison is a circle or it's round. And all the cells are along the exterior wall, all these floors. So there's all cells that can be viewed from the interior um, guard watchtower. The inside of the round circle is a tower where guards can watch. But you, you make sure that the glass around the tower is opaque, so no one can see in, you can only see out. What that means is that a prisoner in a cell on the exterior part um, of this um, can be watched at any time by someone who's in the guard tower. And because of the way it's, it's a color, the prisoner never knows if he's being watched. He just knows he could be being watched. And Foucault basically explains how what this means is, rather than really fearing actually being watched, it, uh, it enables prisoners to begin to live as if they're being watched at all times. Um, and so it's an internalization of surveillance. Uh, it's not about true surveillance anymore. It's about the idea of being surveilled that you take into yourself and therefore start to live like you're under surveillance at all times. So at some point, you could conceivably not even have guards in that town. No one, the prisoners would never know. But after a certain period of time, perhaps they would act and live in a way where they wouldn't actually do anything wrong. So this is the move from an external form of disciplinary uh, activity, uh, like breaking the body in a public sector where the whole community comes out, versus moving those kinds of processes internally so people police their own behavior out of the imagination that they're being surveilled. All right, so one of my main points in thinking about Foucault again, kind of from the American studies for the topics that I have with people today. Well, we just need to recognize, first of all, that there have been historical shifts in the organization and exercise of power in uh, Western society that have led human beings, including us, to take up and to take in practices of self-surveillance and self-discipline in service to interests that are not necessarily our own that we um, are acting in ways that we think maybe the state could be uh, expecting us to act, or other powerful authority figures in ways that um, aren't what we would choose if we had complete, full, and open uh, opportunity. And that these shifts have occurred through modern institutions that affect large numbers of people. These include the fields of education, you know, university is a place where um, you know, there are these kinds of processes of work, I would have argued, and of course, mental health. Back to the book about you know, mental health, uh, specifically the history of the asylum. Um, and so he traced these in the birth of the school and of the asylums and of other institutions of how this kind of exterior authority and control moved from uh, outside agents and efforts to become internalized in ways that we police ourselves. Now, that's all I'm going to do with Foucault, other than to come back to these ideas. So, is that clear enough? Do we get a sense for what I'm saying? Okay, very good. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about indigenous boarding schools. Um, this is another instance where, probably given because of who the audience is and who's come out to this, I'm not going to go into great detail. This, this, this kind of narrative is very well known. The specifics are often known by different people as well. Uh, so I'm assuming it's pretty reasonably well known in this audience, but I'll just go over some of the basic facts to refresh your memory. So um, these schools, which were residential or industrial schools for Indian youth, that were developed uh, by uh, an army officer named Captain Pratt um, and then distributed all throughout the United States and Canada um, for the purposes of assimilating Indian kids into white society. Uh, they were deliberately assimilated. The slogan of these schools was kill the Indian, save the man. So um, the idea was that you could uh, make um, <coughs> the savages civilized through this process of education into civilization, right? Um, now, um, as I said, they were invented by Captain Pratt. He did this because first he was an army officer who was engaged in war in the Southwest. He had a number of uh, captive uh, Indians from that part of the country. They took all the way to Fort Augustine in Florida, and he was responsible for overseeing those prisoners in Fort Augustine. They were a prisoner for a number of years, 
and he, you know, structured things for them to do, and, uh, you know, we've got famous ledger art that comes out of that experience, for example. And this kind of gave him the idea of how to structure a school, not for grown men now who are warriors, but for young Indian students, that you could structure in a way to maximize the processes of civilizing them out of their, you know, primitive, uh, unacceptable existence in the modern life. The thing we forget, looking back today, of course, is that this was progressive thinking. Most people in America, well, you know, there's always been reformers and people who are more politically progressive and people who thought Indians weren't being treated right. So there's always kind of that back and forth. But lots of people in America just thought Indians are going to vanish anyway. Don't waste one more government dollar on Indians. Just let them vanish already and let's get on with it. So the idea of investing money in schools for training Indians and civilizing them was, you know, not because of everybody's liking. It was politically progressive at the time to think this was. Obviously not today. Carlisle Indian School, therefore, was established in Pennsylvania in 1879. And about that same time, Nicholas Flood Davin in Canada took the same kind of model that Blue Branch from the U.S. and started doing the same thing in Canada. So the U.S. and Canada have had these kinds of schools. Also, you can find them in Australia. Uh, so in the former British Commonwealth, this became an institution for the community of these people that had these same kinds of parameters. Um, Interestingly, too, it's an instance in which the usual separation between church and state broke down because the federal government paid for these schools, but then they often paid churches to run them. And so the complicit with Christian churches as part of the you know, civilizing mission was to bring Indian uplift through Christianization. And so you can find regular government offer, operated boarding schools all around the country uh, throughout this period of time. but. Uh, Probably the majority of them were operated by churches uh, who had deliberate Christianization missionary efforts going on through these schools. There were about 200 or over 200 boarding schools between the US and Canada of this fashion. They were very similar in how they were put together and set up uh, early on in the 1880s. Um, and tens of thousands of Indian students went through these schools, um, although uh, over the course of many decades. Um, now, there's a couple of nuances that we don't get into too much detail, but in the United States, for example, after 1930, there was a re reform movement that kind of shifted the mission in schools away from that really raw, assimilative uh, mission to be something that was a little better than that. Um, and, but that wasn't necessarily the case in Canada, where that kind of old school assimilation commitment was going on far longer. Also, even though tens of thousands of kids went through these schools, there was never a majority of Indian kids even who were sent to these kinds of schools. Most Indians never went through these kinds of schools. Nevertheless, a good number did. All right, so that's really all I want to say about the boarding schools to add and remind and refresh your memory in terms of things you really know. The main points are essentially that uh, many schools, especially early on in that movement, represent a fusion of Foucauldian institutions, the very kinds of things he was talking about that are designed to exert authority and control in ways that uh, bring that into an internalized process. They blended features of prison, military, and educational practices. So these schools, uh, the punishment was harsh, like so prison punishment. Um, it was very severe and bumpy for not uh, doing what you're supposed to do. It would be locked up behind a, a closet or with bread and water for a good period of time sometimes. So the corporal punishment was very prison-like. And of course, he was regulated like prisoners, where you were lined up, you had a number assigned to you, everything you did uh, was you know, in a very regimented fashion. Um, and um, it was also um, also uh, quite a bit like um, the military, in the sense that boys in particular um, wore military-style uniforms. They spent part of the day in drill and ceremony, which is all about good order and discipline, which would be just right there, good order and discipline. is something we also call them. Um, and um, it, it, all kinds of limited resources then combined with these sorts of things that you're a really desperate situation. Um, there were inadequate funding for all of these schools. They were always on a pittance. Students hardly had enough to eat. What they did have to eat wasn't very nutritious, et cetera. The staff were poorly trained, not well paid. Uh, obviously, they had ethnocentric ideologies. Uh, the, uh, the children themselves were vulnerable wards, sometimes very young children, four years old and whatnot. And a gen general absence of accountability, because the whole thing's overseen by a government that is trying not to spend money on Indians and Indian problems. And so when you have a situation like this where a, a few people have a lot of power behind closed doors and remote places without supervision, 
a great deal of um, bad things can happen. And this really precipitated a fairly widespread uh, legacy of abuse of children in these schools. Uh, whether you just think about being beaten um, as forms of punishment as a kind of corporal or physical abuse, um, you also have to recognize that there was a lot of sexual abuse. Um, you know, we, there's not like numbers or statistics you could turn to that really know like how extensively it happened such that how many teachers, for example, or priests were involved in this stuff. But certainly some priests and some uh, teachers were, and it doesn't take more than one or two priests or, or teachers in a school to actually hurt generations of Indian kids. So um, widespread abuse is a legacy of these schools. And, and, and that's not even talking about death. Um, that doesn't mean like being murdered, but it does mean like not having adequate nutrition and not being protected from disease well enough so that medical care is terrible. And so whenever the next epidemic or something sweeps through, you know, kids die off. So a lot of kids die in these schools on I mean, the epidemic level deaths that it, back in that time period, I guess wasn't unheard of among the, the poor classes. But at the same time, if you're under the stewardship of the government, you think there'd be uh, an obligation to take better care. So in response to all that, then, it's important to recognize that it's the long-term spiritual, cultural, and psychological impacts of these abuses that figure so centrally in both historical and biographical narratives about indigenous experiences in these boarding schools. And now there's a whole little cottage industry of books that people have written about their boarding school experiences, and you can find them on Amazon. And um, part of what's happening in Canada is there's a Truth and Reconciliation Commission going on that the government initiated, which is holding hearings all throughout the country to allow Aboriginal people to come forward and testify before the TRC about their experiences in residential schools. And so these, essentially, uh, people are coming to talk of, you know, provide trauma narratives of the experiences they have in the school. And it's being reported and written into the record, and reparations are being offered, monetary damages, and so on. So uh, it's really culminating. So that's the boarding school experiences. The third thing I want to do is then link that to this notion of indigenous historical trauma. Um, because especially in Canada, when we talk about indigenous historical trauma, and there it's the legacy of the boarding schools, or the residential schools that, they call it, that we're really talking about. In the US, the boarding schools are part of the indigenous legacy of historical trauma, but people would also talk about other things like massacres and being chased by the enemy and forced on reservations and those sorts of things too. It tends to be in the United States, people talk more about genocide and genocidal campaigns than they do in Canada. In Canada, it's really the schools, first of all, although those are described as genocide. <coughs> um, but in historical trauma is one way that people talk about the impact of this kind of school experience. So, what is historical trauma? Um, this is a, a term, a health concept, that's been promoted by Native social work researchers initially and professional psychologists. Uh, it, was most, it was introduced, the actual term historical trauma was really introduced by a social work researcher named Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, who herself is a Lakota uh, trainee getting clinical expertise in the New York area somewhere. And during her clinical training, she had an exposure to psychoanalytic practice, especially with uh, Jewish people and some of whom were Holocaust survivors, and came to recognize that within Jewish treatment of Jewish people in psychoanalysis pertaining to the Holocaust, there's this idea that uh, the second generation of Holocaust survivors, that is the offspring, the kids of uh, people who had survived the Holocaust, were um, not doing very well at all. And for clinical purposes, required a whole way of understanding what was going on for them. Since they themselves didn't go through the Holocaust, their parents did. Something was up. And so Maria took this idea and recognized that as a Lakota woman and a, a member of uh, those tribes, that they had wounded me in their history, the massacre of wounded me, which said to be the closing of the Indian Wars in which hundreds of Lakota um, non-combatants primarily were murdered by the U.S. 7th Cavalry in 1890. And um, so recognizing that the Holocaust could have its impact on its offspring in that way, she started to develop this notion of indigenous historical trauma as the similar kind of parallel kind of processes that could have wounded me, leading to uh, a creation of risk and vulnerability in Lakota communities as well. So this idea, Maria kind of tells her jokes that she's the mother of historical trauma, which is sort of a funny way to put it. But, um, you know, it really consists of some certain ideas here. First of all, again, it's a psychoanalytic framing of Holocaust trauma. 
Psychoanalysis, as you know, was developed by Freud. Uh, it's a way of thinking about psychotherapy that has to do with unconscious conflicts that require therapy to uncover such that neuroses can be cured. And uh, the psychoanalytic framing of Holocaust trauma also was kind of associated and linked to this uh, notion in psychiatry today of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, most of us have heard of PTSD uh, because of the wars that were fighting around the world, and many of the veterans have come back with this affliction. But PTSD only entered the uh, psychiatric vocabulary in 1980. So it's really not that old of a disorder in terms of psychiatry has been doing in the DSM since the 50s. Um, and um, uh, obviously, to have post traumatic stress disorder, you have to have a model of how trauma works and how people can be afflicted with it and what you have to do to try and, and create it. And PTSD, in some ways, is the template that historical trauma has followed a little thinking about what to do with folks who have experienced type of pain. In Maria's case, it was generalization of the Wounded Bee Massacre, but beyond the Wounded Bee Proper for just Lakota people now, for any people that sort of said that a certain colonization history, as well as genocidal uh, experiences of various kinds that have led to indigenous historical trauma. And the thing I want to point out, too, is that we're talking about, when it comes to trauma, a certain way of describing or talking about experience. What, you know, Foucault could analyze as a discourse, again, a set way of thinking and talking about a kind of experience uh, that has a whole set of attending institutions and practices and people and roles associated with it. Um, but what's interesting about historical trauma is it, take, it goes beyond the trauma narrative of an individual trauma survivor, like might happen in the treatment of PTSD or the psychotherapy of someone with a trauma in their past that's been bothering them. It generalizes now into a broader narrative, not just about an individual, but about a community, a historical trauma narrative that's going to have very similar echoes of what we might think of as personal trauma narratives, but describing entire collectivities of people across generations instead of a single individual. Now, as I said before, identification of boarding schools as a key source of historical trauma for many people is really, really important. This is especially so in Canada. Canada had this uh, big uh, commission in the 1990s called the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, where they first started hearing from Aboriginal people and testimony that the boarding school legacy was really important to attend to. Um, then they created the Aboriginal Healing Foundation in Canada and awarded $350 million for the disbursement of grants for communities to do healing projects so that their own community members can recover from the legacy of abuse in the residential schools. And of course now, as I said, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which takes it a step further in terms of um, not only creating a public record and trying to call this, the country to account for that legacy, but um, offering monetary compensation to people who experience that. Now, historical trauma, um, can be talked about in a colloquial sense uh, as a simile for this, what I would call just post-colonial distress. <coughs> Historical trauma, post-colonial distress. Um, it, there's a way in which um, if people often use the term and that's what they mean, post-colonial distress in indigenous communities. And um, I don't have any problem with using that term, with, with the idea of post-colonial distress, the way in which post-colonial distress ties into mental health problems today, some things as a, as a frame of reference or the context. Um, I, do, I do think that post-colonial distress is a better term to use than historical trauma, if that's all we mean. And I can talk about that in the discussion behind the people like it. But they're in the academic sense, that is a sense in which it's uh, promoted by people like Maria, who's on faculty at the University of New Mexico, and Karina Walters, who's a social work researcher at the University of Washington, Bonnie Duran, who's a public health uh, scientist at the University of Washington, and a host of other um, native uh, health scientists. Um, it doesn't mean just post-colonial distress. It has some other features. So first of all, as you look back and try to analyze where this term came from, what it sort of means, and how it's talked about today in these academic circles, really you've got two old concepts that it's putting together. One of those is historical oppression, the idea that you know, in my past, my people were um, you know, deliberately harmed in some way by some dominant uh, force or group in society. It led that to the modern notion of psychological trauma. The idea that um, if we experience something really, really horrific, it can disrupt our psychology in ways that require, that we can maybe not recover from on our own and may even need therapeutic support to recover. So by putting historical oppression together with the notion of psychological trauma, you end up with what people are promoting as historical trauma. 
And the way they talk about it is as if it were what's going to be called a social determinant of health. It's a public health way of framing health problems in a population as not just about biology gone wrong or genes that aren't, you know, propelling the population, but that, you know, social things can happen, like poverty can limit your ability to have adequate nutrition, therefore your growth might be stunted. Or um, you might have access to lead in your house in, in the peak of a slumlord's apartment and your baby could eat it and have brain damage. You know, so there's social determinants of health. That is one way that people have tried to locate health within its social context. And historical trauma kind of is talked about in that same way. You know, for the people who originated the term historical trauma, there were some purposes they were trying to serve with this idea. And they're purposes that largely I would agree with. I think they're fine things to try to do. First of all, they're interested in explaining indigenous health disparities. So recognizing that indigenous communities that for some kinds of problems we have those problems way more than other communities that surround us in the United States. So uh, an explanation for those is something we do need. Um, it will seek to contextualize indigenous health problems within you know historical, political, and social context, which is kind of what social determinants of health in general is doing. Um, that makes sense to me. I mean, colonization does have a legacy to it. It, it sets up social arrangements in ways that are unjust in which poverty becomes a part of your life, in which opportunity and access and quality are not very um, uh, available. And that has huge ramifications for what you're able to do as a community for your own future. So contextualizing these health problems using this makes good sense to me. Uh, a big part of it was to de-stigmatize the kind of self-blame that people get caught up into, say, substance abuse or violence or um, other kinds of problems can um, uh, end up uh, experiencing in such a way that they never will get help because they all, all they can focus on is how terrible a person they are and that doesn't take you very far. But if you can reframe that, oh, well, you're not alone in this. I mean, our whole community has had to cope with, you know, we have other people who are going through the same thing you're going through because of things that our ancestors have gone through because of the arrangements we live in. And together, we can find a way to do this that, um, you know, reconsolidates who we are as a people, tries to build a better community and so on. This um, obviously takes the individual out of the focus, out of the spotlight in a way, and therefore helps the individual paradoxically maybe make a change where they were feeling totally mired um, or stuck in the mud before in terms of that opportunity. Finally, it, it also legitimates indigenous therapeutic traditions. Um, these folks who wrote this, um, Maria in particular, has tried to harness the code of ceremonies as a way to uh, come through or end or reverse the impact of historical trauma. Um, and now that's not all it is. Uh, she also uses all kinds of clinical ideas and therapies too, but it's a wedding or a recognition that there's a wide range of therapeutic resources available. Um, to better qualify or characterize what historical trauma means, there are really four C's that I try to uh, tell people that help them get a handle on what uh, this means relative to people who propose it. The first one is that historical trauma is about colonial injury. So um, above anything else, it's about mass group oppression or genocides, massacres, reservation captivity, the fact that white people did things to Indian people that uh, were involved in the dispossession uh, of them of their land and the eradication of a way of life in, in ways that have long-term consequences for our communities. So that colonial injury is really central to what historical trauma is configured to be. Then, as I said before, it's collectively experienced. It's not just one individual here and there. It's the idea that the whole community, therefore, has repercussions from the fact that this colonization has impacted not just a few people, but you know, the entire community in important ways. Moreover, it's said to cumulatively escalate. That is, it's one thing to be hit by a smallpox epidemic in the mid-19th century here in Montana on the Plains, um, and then to be forcibly settled onto a reservation in the 1870s, and then to almost starve to death because the government never sends the rations that they promised, um, and then uh, to be forced to have your kids taken away under pressure to go to school or learn how to be like white people, and then to be mired in reservation poverty with no chance of economic development because of the way the whole land trust system is set. Um, and that, the idea is that each of these things would be bad enough, but you start piling them on in a series of people over a couple generations, and it's like a snowball gathering uh, force over time to really cripple people's opportunities and chances for being well. Finally, and really importantly as well, it's understood to be cross-generationally cross transmitted. Um, that is, 
the notion here is that ancestral <laughs> trauma is somehow carried forward um, and reasons and mechanisms that are not really specified necessarily, maybe through some spiritual process. People are now excited about the science of epigenetics as maybe an explanation or a mechanism for how the fact that your grandparent or great grandparent suffered a wound of knee, how three generations later a young person coming up in the world is somehow more vulnerable to whatever experiences they're going to have with the negative variety, it's going to throw them for a loop harder than with a normal person. That they're more at risk, they're more vulnerable to upsets in their life because their ancestors went through this stuff. So that's a really important component of all the four scenes of historical trauma as it's been described. As I said before, it's understood to kind of snowball. People who promote this idea don't talk about it like losing steam after 10 generations. Actually, they say the opposite. They say the longer it goes on without in therapeutic intervention of some kind, the worse it gets. So I guess that would mean 10 generations would be worse than two, and 20 would be worse than 10. Uh, anyway, it goes on and on and on, presumably getting worse and worse and worse, unless or until it's healed in some way, therapeutic. Now, this is really taken off of that. But who's heard of historical trauma before you walked into the room? Uh, anyone heard of this term of story? Yeah, I've heard quite a few of you. Uh, and um, it's certainly in Indian country, everywhere you go, you hear this today. Um, people use it very casually. And most people, I don't think, really know that there's all this behind it necessarily. You know, they're using it anymore just because of, it, it's a way of, a, a hope and a way of talking about the past. But, um, you know, there's some weird ways it plays out sometimes. So I have, um, colleagues all around the country in various native studies programs. One of them wrote me one day and said, you know, what's going on with this idea of historical trauma? And, and um, he went on to describe some stuff he was experiencing in his classroom, um, where he was teaching in a native studies course at a big um, state university where students, native students were coming into the class and then objecting to some of the stuff that the instructor who was native to was trying to do on the grounds that was bothering their historical trauma. So. Um, you know, uh, he wrote me this, he said, um, increasingly I have native students who claim they suffer from historical trauma, which manifests in a variety of ways. One, they cannot read, because reading is colonial, and forces them to relieve their, relive their historical trauma. My solution is told them to go to disability services, get the book on tape. Um, they can't uh, take tests, like number one, testing is colonial, and being forced to relieve their historical trauma, etc. So, it would be as stunning or jarring as an educator, to have students coming into your university classroom who have the privilege of all privileges, the envy of the world, actually, to come to a, a U.S. university and get an education, but who are saying that they can't participate in the most basic elements of that education because of their historical trauma. So there are reasons then, at least in some of these um, instances, to ask and to wonder to what degree historical trauma in this widespread uptake in usage throughout Indian country um, could be useful. Now, there are certain socio-political functions that historical trauma is serving when people take it up and use it. And I think if you watch how people use it and how they talk about it and uh, um, the way it, it, it works uh, to people's advantage, um, it's easy to understand why it would take off and be taken up in ways of this. One thing that talking about historical trauma or framing your experiences in light of historical trauma does is it seizes the moral high ground. For um, it's a way of talking about your oppression that immediately kind of stops some kinds of conversations from happening, and you can actually insulate um, or something you might be saying or particularly or particularly from from the critique or the challenge of questioning, because uh, the authority of your experience of that oppressive nature is such that um, people really dare to ask you a tough question. Trauma also has a way of legitimizing various kinds of claims. So um, that's been the case since trauma was invented or born into modern life. Um, trauma uh, used to mean, in, in medical terms, injury to the body. But it started to become meaning injury to the mind in the 1860s, I believe it was, in Britain, when um, high-speed railroad roads were invented. And so you have passengers careening through the British countryside, and, and sometimes they would derail or crash. Passengers sent flying through the cars, and they would stumble off those cars in order to survive, and they would have all these symptoms for weeks. Now, some of them could never get back to their life again. 
Um, and so it led neurologists, especially at the time, or medical professionals who studied the brain and the nervous system, to try to articulate, well, what's going on? How come they're, you know, the symptoms they have are really interesting. Like, you know, photophobia, which has to do with the uh, can't be around light, unsteady gait, um, palpitations, and just lots of different symptoms in a laundry list of 30 symptoms maybe people were experiencing that looked like maybe neurological symptoms, but neurologists at the time couldn't exactly figure out what's going on with that. The reason it was important for neurology to try to figure out what's going on with that is because these people were making claims against the railroads, basically saying, okay, you've hurt me, I can't even work, and so I'm entitled to compensation. And so that gets played out around whether there's resources to help the offer and these guys to be injured in that way. And trauma has always been associated with those kinds of compensation claims. Um, for Vietnam veterans returning home, which is how PTSD got into the Bible of psychiatry to begin with, it's about whether you're fully disabled, partly disabled, whether you're able to get services from the government, um, and, uh, and so on. So, um, with claims in the courts today, uh, it's hard to get it's hard to get compensation for damages if you can't demonstrate that you've been injured in some way. And psychological injury is the way you can try to demonstrate that. So there's a sense in which invoking trauma can uh, legitimate claims for um, all kinds of purposes, including actual compensation. But beyond that, disability or asylum, refugees are coming from around the world. Often refugees have to have a PTSD diagnosis to be allowed into the country as a refugee. And so psychiatrists are out there working in languages that, with translators in languages that few people in the world even speak in psychiatric terms, trying to work out, does this person bona fide, have bona fide PTSD or not? So, they can, uh, have it. so that's another socio-political function it serves. It seizes the moral hydron, it exhumates points. The third one is that it kind of refashions one's identity. Um, and it does so for many people in the indigenous system of trauma. It's essentially talking about ourselves as people who are fundamentally wounded by history. It talks about the fact that not only has history been tough, terrible, bad, but that we carry something as a result of that. That's about risk, disability, vulnerability, distress, and so on. So it uh, becomes an expression of identity, whether it's cultural community identity or personal identity as a function of that, in ways that are um, quite notable. And as a result of that, the final function it serves is it ends up remaking the self in some really interesting ways. And that is, it has implications for how we even think of who we are fundamentally as people. Um, and you know, when you start to view yourself as a traumatized individual or as um, someone who um, is recovering from trauma or in recovery from trauma, someone who's been victimized in that way, um, you can take on an identity that is one that is about being damaged um, or disorder or disabled in some way. So there are these functions that are served uh, by uh, invoking this term historical trauma. Finally, I want to kind of draw our attention to the genealogy of historical trauma, which means where does it come from? How, how do you, you know, if you chase your ancestors, in this case, we're tracing the ancestry of an idea. And I told you about the real and all that a little bit already. But you know, one thing that's interesting to note is that trauma itself. Uh, as I said, came into existence in psychiatry in the 1980s. But as a colloquial term that we use in everyday life, that's only about 15, 20 years old. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't use the term trauma like we do in everyday discourse now. It's a term that has become widely in use for colloquial purposes, like talking about things that go wrong in our day and how we are traumatized, or how, you know, now my family is doing more trauma drama. And, I mean, it's just a way of talking about experience. And that uh, reflects a social change that is different. It's globalized, first of all. This term is everywhere now. It's circulating throughout the world, in part because Western psychiatry is circulating throughout the world. Um, but one way that I noted this shift was that I undertook some research in the 90s on the Philadelphia Education with four months, and was asking people about the origins of the depression and drinking and other kinds of problems like that. I was doing this because I wanted to know from them what are uh, the explanations you have to offer for this in your own terms, not my terms as a trained mental health professional. I want to know how local people understand this. And um, one individual who wanted to be identified by his Indian name, traveling from there, had a really well elaborated sense of where these problems come from in the community. And he talked about history and spirituality. He basically said, before white people came, we had a ceremonial system in place that uh, made sure everything was in harmony and balance. 
But then colonization occurred, and an important goal of colonizers was to eradicate those ceremonies. And so we lost the ability to live in harmony in that way. And it led us then uh, to have a post-colonial anime. Anime means no name. The sense of, a, of not knowing who you are, where you're fit, what your purpose in the world is, is an existential one. This is a spiritual crisis um, in which, you know, of course, depression and drinking and suicide and all things fall in the way of that. Um, and so we had a historical sense for where this came from. And it was not a psychological explanation. It wasn't about individuals, even. It was about the community as a whole suffering from a disruption of sacred tradition that kept everything in balance. So I asked him, I said, well, under what conditions, then, would you, like, send a relative to IHS behavioral health where the psychiatrists and social workers and psychologists work? And he got quiet for a little bit. And he said, you know, um, that's kind of like taboo. We don't do that. And he went on to explain that why he would be reluctant to do that is because he saw mental health, clinical mental health, as the very province of the white man system, the same system that is eradicated as families to begin with. And he said, that's the last place to send someone for help. So I said, well, what would you do instead? He said, well, you know, we take them to ceremony. And so the idea of reclaiming and revitalizing the very sacred traditions that colonization attempted to eradicate, for him, was the therapeutic answer for these kinds of problems. Now, the thing that's interesting to me about this is it's mostly an age psychological account. It isn't about, you know, poison genes or broken brains, the usual things that colonists will tell a story about when it comes to the problems. And he never mentioned the word trauma. So this was in 1999, actually. He never mentioned the word trauma. I don't know. I should try to find him and ask him today, you know, if he's heard of historical trauma. But, but you know, so the trauma piece is a psychological piece to this that he was not talking about, really. And it's something that's been circulating now in society here and around the world in a way that now it's picked up and taken off. And the thing I want to point out about that is I think this concern about trauma and the way it's been taken up and circulated reflects its specific expression as as a, as a component or a part of what we call therapy culture, or what can we call it therapy culture. All right, so we return to therapy culture in a minute, but let me just say where I think we're trying to get across here, that boarding school abuses are really regularly designed as, are designated as a primary example of indigenous historical trauma that has harmed former students in ways that are said to contain a legacy of ongoing physical <coughs> risk or disability for the descendants, and this legacy is thought to carry forward in more or less indefinite fashion, potentially growing worse along the way, unless or until it's addressed by means of therapeutic intervention, including counseling and a related psychosocial services. So it's traditional stuff you can do, but it's not just that. Um, the points of this talk about a whole bunch of therapeutic stuff, including stock counseling and human services. Now, I think it's really important to note that uh, uh, historical trauma was promoted by native health professionals, many of whom are clinically trained, because that helps to recognize or understand why um, trauma is so important as part of the concept and therapeutic intervention is really important to it. I mean, it comes out of a certain uh, sense of clinical uh, orientation and organization. Clinical intervention is recognized as an important component of the healing process from historical trauma. And I myself have looked at ideas of how Indian communities might try to wed together tra indigenous tradition and psych modern conventional psychotherapeutic approaches in a study I did in the Manitoba First Nations community. Now, I don't want to spend too, too much time on this very brief research excursion just to get the idea of what indigenous communities might be up to when they wed together indigenous healing practices and mainstream therapeutic approaches. So, I told you about the Aboriginal Healing Foundation that awarded money for healing projects throughout Canada, tailored again to the legacy of the residential school abuse. And I was funded by them to do this one project in the Manitoba Healing Lodge. And uh, this healing lodge was a substance abuse treatment center. It was accredited nationally in Canada, which there were not very many Aboriginal programs in this network. Um, it was uh, run, run uh, by Western Algonquian tribal community. It was accountable to the band itself, so it was really administered and controlled by the community, staffed by tribal members, um, and it was a national credit. It did center on substance abuse treatment, but of course the, the grant from the Aboriginal Healing Foundation is about the broader legacy of residential schools, and so it was funding the outpatient program, recognizing that substance abuse was just one piece of what you might expect from the legacy of residential schools. 
resources. The interesting thing about this place, of course, was it was explicitly, overtly committed to integrating Western and Aboriginal approaches together in helping everyone. And the central question I had in doing this work was, what is healing? Like, what does it mean in the discourse and practices of the staff and clients in the center to recover from these residential abuses? Well, the, the medicine wheel, or a version of the medicine wheel, was really central and important for how they understood what they were up to. But basically, the meaning of healing had a couple of explicit uh, ideas, things that they would readily say and talk about consciously, and then several implicit ones. And I just wanted to just briefly tell you that. Um, the explicit means of healing, which any of the staff and some of the clients could tell you about, were that involved existential transformations of self that would you know, link one to a higher sense of purpose. So we're casting about in a life of chaos and you find a way through healing to um, become anchored and motivated to live a different life for, a different, for an actual purpose that you didn't have before. And a big part of it here was it involved a, a reclamation of one's Aboriginal identity, cultural identity as an Aboriginal person. So two things going on, the kind of transformative healing process itself, but in a way that was definitely positive and pro-Aboriginal and bolstering that identity. Now, there were implicit meanings as well. Implicit meanings of healing, which means that no one said these three things. Instead, they told me a lot of stuff, and then I had to interpret from the things they said what the logics were that undergird. Those included these three components, emotional burdens, cathartic expression, and self as project introspection. So, emotional burdens is the idea that you've been hurt in your past, often in childhood, and that as a result of being hurt by someone sexually abused, say physically abused, neglected in some way, you carry that pain forward more or less indefinitely in your life. It weighs you down. It can derail your trajectory in some cases. And the only way you can deal with those emotional burdens, cast them off, so to speak, and be liberated from those burdens, is to engage in a therapeutic process of cathartic <coughs> expression. Um, that is, in group therapy, or more likely in this community, individual therapy, you disclose what happened to you. You have an emotional uh, uh, expression around that disclosure that's appropriate to the pain you're carrying. And by acknowledging that in that way, it allows you to move past it and to unshoulder those burdens <coughs> and to start down a different direction. And finally, the different direction is going to start down your healing journey, as it's referred to in this place. Um, it involves a turn looking inward, the recognition that, OK, I might have been living my life oriented out there to whatever's going on in the world, but now I have to turn inward and I have to make myself a project requiring a lot of work and energy and time and effort so I can get right and in balance and whole and healed again. Okay? Make sense? Those three things coming together. The summary meaning of healing in the place then was that healing was an ongoing process of positive self-transformation that comes to this compound that we talk about that ultimately reorients fragile and often damaged selves toward a meaningful and healthy engagement. Now, what's really interesting about the place is um, it was heavily committed to Aboriginal <coughs> approach, Aboriginal symbols, Aboriginal therapeutic processes. But really at the core here, at the most, at the, especially the unexpressed or implicit level, it's pop psych. You know, it's like Freud, but of course worked out in all kinds of popular ways and taken out by counselors and staff here. Uh, it represents, therefore, a, a culmination of really, a therapy culture, really in the heart of the program itself, in a way that uh, people were practicing the movement without being the movement. And it leads to this question that I all started at the beginning, which is to ask how, and to wonder, how emancipatory is therapy culture? So that's the last thing I want us to do today, is talk about therapy culture. Um, so the question we have now then is how liberating or emancipatory, or if you prefer, decolonizing, is therapy culture. I got this picture from the New York Times. I just love it. It's, um, you know, there's not too many places where you find psychoanalysts still you know, doing this kind of work. Um, but in New York, again. Um, therapy culture is uh, described really as the circulation of psychotherapeutic ideas and sensibilities throughout our society. It started to receive scholarly attention as early as the 1960s. 
Um, and that scholarly attention is often happening in sociology, and often happening by people who are influenced by Freud, I mean by Foucault, thinking about the way society is organized and how power gets expressed through social institutions to create subjectivity of a certain kind that we don't ever get to opt into or opt out of it, that just ends up being who we are because of how society is working. Um, so it's concerned with issues of discourse, of power, of personhood, that thinks about what therapy culture might be. Now in psychology, we have a little bit of this. Some of you in psychology might have come across the work of Philip Cushman, who writes about the empty self. And of a certain era, I think he's revised this over time, because one thing about culture and society is that there's always on the move. It doesn't stay still very long. Um, so when you first started writing about this, the idea was that um, Americans have empty selves that require filling through consumption. And so there's a big way that, you know, and of course that's tied to the economic system. Right? Um, but in human services like sociology, history, political science, cultural studies, we have Philip Reeves' classic 1966 triumph of therapeutic, Andrew Polsky's 1991 The Rise of the Therapeutic State, Nicholas Rose's 1998 Inventing Ourselves, even Moskowitz's 2001 in Therapy and Trust. There's, I actually want to teach in a graduate seminar at some point, but just looks over the part of my 10 books on the shelf. And look at therapy culture at a some kind of sociological or societal relations. For today, I just want to briefly sketch the argument of Frank Ferretti from his book, Therapy Culture. And this book, Therapy Culture, is really talking about the US and the UK. So um, the US and UK have a lot of common, of course, but, um, some differences too. In many cases, he's talking about both settings. And I think he doesn't see that huge of a difference between the two national settings with regard to how therapy comes to his. His uh, critique, his argument, his observations, his analysis are really that, first of all, that therapy culture, of course, had a place in psychiatry, in professional psychology, and social work, you know, behind closed doors in the clinic, uh, which were not very central to, want to social life for a long time. But that in recent decades, therapy culture really has escaped this professional or clinical milieu and begun to permeate society much more broadly. So that you can find it on every talk show or in everyday speaking, um, in your taking your kids to school, or um, all, all hosts of areas of everyday life are permeated with therapy culture now. Um, and he starts by observing that modernity that is a mode of life that came online after uh, the Enlightenment, um, the rise of science, and the collapse of religion as a way for most Europeans to make sense of their lives. Um, modernity eroded old systems of meaning, especially religion. That, um, whereas in the old days, people had a very clear purpose and role in life. They were born, there was this cosmic drama between God and the devil, there was salvation, there was participating in the church, and you know that your virtue was what you were to cultivate, uh, character was what people evaluated on, and devotion and prayer and those kinds of things. In other words, you know, the Christian church in Europe provided a way for people's lives to make good sense. But when modernity came and upended faith in those kinds of institutions, then uh, people started to not have a nice, clear script for how to live their lives. So old systems of meaning were eroded, and therefore people were no longer furnished unambiguous expectations about their purpose, or their role, or their status, or their direction in life. It led to fragmentation of, you know, who I am, what I'm supposed to do, and pretty soon I'm just doing the stuff that people have to do to live, but what does it all mean, and how does it all tie together, becomes kind of elusive. And in that uh, kind of context, Ferretti argues, individuals become responsible, even obligated, to chart their own path and make their own meaning. But now, whereas the church used to provide that, and, and um, what happens is, uh, when it all falls apart, every individual has to shoulder this responsibility to chart their own path, to invent themselves, essentially, over the course of their life. And, uh, it, which leads to individuation because everyone can go their own way or do their own thing and it's not like put together anymore. And so this organization, sorry, this obligation to chart your own path and make your own meaning uh, is disorienting, it's isolating, it's anxiety provoking, and it's burdensome. Now, in the context of this fragmentation and individuation, according to Ferretti, that modernity brings, therapy culture is what emerged to fill this void by promising self-actualization and self-fulfillment 
of otherwise disconnected and fragmented individuals. So the individuals who are now like careening about trying to make sense of their life and cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, uh, you know existential angst, and therapy culture says, okay, we are the solution for this problem. We can help you find yourself and learn how to actualize um, and uh, to um, find fulfillment in your career. But in reality, according to Ferretti, therapy culture actually only makes things worse. It says it can solve the problem of, of not uh, having a group purpose anymore. But in reality, it, it, it uh, only makes that whole anxiety-ridden situation worse. Now, how does it do it? Well, according to Ferretti, Therapy culture first circulates new scripts for society about emotional vulnerability and the tending preoccupation with the vulnerable self. In other words, we start to think and worry and talk about things like self-esteem, uh, whether our kids have enough self-esteem that we carry forward. Not like in the old days where we didn't have a concept of self-esteem, but you lived a good life, and if you lived a good life, then it was a happy life. Um, but now we're focused on whether you're happy, and if you're not happy, why aren't you happy? And it could be because you have low self-esteem. Or ideas of emotional abuse of various kinds, uh, and psychological survival after in the, in the wake of various difficulties. <coughs> uh, Freddie wrote, for example, quote, this is the age of traumas, syndromes, disorders, and addiction. Okay? The scripts for emotional vulnerability and the bones. He said that, or he observed that therapy culture promises self-actualization and self-fulfillment, but in reality what it does is it promotes a diminished sense of self, <coughs> a permanent consciousness of vulnerability. That is, um, it, it suggests that actually you're so vulnerable and so fragile, uh, and, and that's, that to be even thinking about self-actualization or self-fulfillment, you first have to come to terms with your own psychological fragility. So it kind of displaces this sense of um, you know, robust resilience in favor of the kind of vulnerability fragility, which um, ultimately, Freddie right, argued, um, therapy culture promised to combat alienation, the isolation, and loneliness, but in reality, it facilitated further individuation, further being on your own and not like other people and uh, not in the relationships that can help you. And, and he claimed it did this really in two ways. First way that therapy culture inadvertently created more isolation, more individuation, was by quote stigmatizing informal relations of dependence. It wasn't informal relation of dependence. Well, that's like family members, you know, you know brothers and sisters that can help people with tough time. Your parents give you advice when things aren't going well. Your kids make you feel better when you know the, the chips are down, or your friends are someone you can provide to and talk to. But what therapy culture says, according to Ferretti, is that oh wait now you, those those people aren't trained professionals. They what, they don't know necessarily what's best for you or right for you or how to can grapple with vulnerability best. And so instead, like the term codependence, it's a term that I hear a lot in Indian country actually, and Indian country really grapples with, <coughs> or kind of tend to be relationally or, or oriented in cultural terms, where codependence starts to get complicated as to what it even means. But codependence is a perfect example of stigmatizing informal relations with of dependence. So instead of doing that, therapy culture makes you suspicious of those relationships and those sources of um, uh, trust and support, and rather it displaces those with, with reliance on professionals instead. Oh, you know, well, who cares about your sister? She doesn't know. I mean, how many credits in psychology does she have? I mean, you know, you need to come into therapy. You need to come get help from counseling, from people who know, who have expertise in human services and can better help you figure out how to make this work. So, therapy culture would seem to involve a retreat to the interior realm of the private self. But in reality, Freddie says, it opens up this private self to professional management in ways that increasingly become the business of government and other external institutions. He actually labels this the professional colonization of everyday life. You know, it's when you take your kids to school and you start getting calls from home because your kids aren't um, up to some uh, institutional standard for what it means to be a healthy kid and they want to maybe put your kids in programs or they want you to come in and um, to find out if you really know how to raise kids properly. He has really great examples from the book of all the, you know, all the little things that happen in everyday life in this community or that community around the schools or around the government in which um, 
there's, you can see an intrusion into what used to be a, a family space by outsiders, especially outsiders that are employed in the government of professional land. Okay, so what are we to make of Ferretti? I mean, I think there's all, this isn't, there's all kinds of reasons to recognize that it's not a flawless argument or there are things we want to know or ask. It's a little bit derivative. I mean, it's later in this set sequence of books. I think if you read some of these other books, you might get uh, some more nuance or something that was said a little earlier than he said it. It could be overstated a little bit just because it happens and some parents get calls from their school that this sort of is an everyday occurrence for everybody. Certainly nostalgic. People who advocate this kind of stuff are looking back to the glory days when people are more robust and more independent and so on. Um, it's uh, certainly debatable um, because whether you think whatever therapy culture might be going on of the kind that Freddie describes, you might also say, well, you have to counterbalance that against what it means to have people who um, really have found help through therapeutic practice and maybe um, haven't been able, you know, whether self-actualization has occurred in some people's lives and so on. Finally, it definitely has a political axe to grind. I mean, this is, it's, it's cultural and political conservatives who are often most enthusiastic about this kind of argument. But I do think it's important to recognize that it captures key elements not just of Freddie, but there's a lot of these kinds of analyses that come out that say these kinds of things. So whether it's this particular piece or that particular piece, I think there's where there's smoke, there's fire, and there's something to be concerned about in terms of the way in which these analyses of society and therapeutic sensibilities are telling us something about the world we have slipped into. In sum, the argument of these folks is that Americans and Westerners in our, in our increasingly globalized world are becoming more individuated, disconnected, and isolated. And such hyper-individuation is increasingly accompanied by disorientation, anxiety, and vulnerability. And finally, the therapeutic technologies are increasingly promoted as a solution, but in reality, are exacerbated. Now I just want to set up some questions. So rhetorical questions, and questions as I'm thinking and get us talking. Right? So on the basis of this analysis, we might ask in this context what it means when entire generations of indigenous peoples are said to suffer from historical trauma, to be at risk for psychosocial problems. What it means when community-based healing projects promote ideas of emotional woundedness, cathartic verbal self-expression, and self as project introspection at the core of their therapeutic activity. What does it mean when indigenous clients arrive to treatment programs as a result of pressure by social workers and courts of law to obtain such services or face even less desirable alternatives, like going to jail or having their kids taken? What does it mean when successful indigenous treatment clients inaugurate their healing journeys and begin to promote therapy culture with great enthusiasm throughout the rest of the community? One thing I didn't say about the medicine or the healing lodge example was that you know, the therapists were very gung-ho about this idea, and it's the clients that I talked to, some had been helped, some hadn't, but the most clients had ever finished the program. Um, and when I talked to clients, the hardest thing for them was to get into the practice of talking, of disclosing and talking publicly about their problem. Um, it suggests that at the core of um, that community programming uh, interface, there was a clear divergence or discordance in how people expect to talk under what conditions, and about what, and in what settings. Community members embraced a cultural script for how, how you go about talking about things that the therapy practitioners had jettisoned by having these experiences and starting these journeys and taking up this stuff. So it was very prescriptive in a way. It was quite interesting. OK, so to return to the critical question I opened the presentation with, is therapy culture properly suited? to addressing the ills of indigenous communities. I think we want to recognize that indigenous peoples today are seen as continuing to bear the wounds stemming from the brain schools. That healing from these wounds is regularly stated to involve therapeutic approaches and interventions that reproduce and expand in our communities various facets of therapy culture. That therapy culture has been criticized for amplifying the very problems of disorienting individuation emotional vulnerability, and professional dependency that it claims to redress. Finally, and most significantly, therapy culture expresses 
exposes indigenous selves for intrusive management by professional authorities, authorities who are increasingly themselves native, and often in the context of government payment for such services. To me, this sounds an awful lot, a lot about the kind of thing Foucault would talk about, that is socialization into practices of self-surveillance and self-discipline. And so I ask you, in closing, is this what indigenous liberation from uh, the colonial legacy of the boarding schools should look like? Emancipation through the medicalization of indigenous experience, promoting wounded spirits and victimized identities, pursuing healing journeys and quasi-professional dependence, embracing therapeutic claims making as a form of faux or pretend justice? What might indigenous self-determination in response to the boarding school legacy look like if we pursued justice more so than healing? To what degree could that be an expression of true sovereignty and self-determination? What would happen if we pursued justice and allowed healing and recovery to take care of themselves in the wake of reparation or some form of um, regress? Uh, I've written a lot of stuff. This isn't written yet, but there are lots of other things that touch on these that are written, so feel free at any time to find what I've written here. And thank you for your attention on this fairly longest talk, and I'm eager to hear what you have to say to me and to each other. Thank you.